submissions for the proposed organic law still open. Minister clamps down on fake passports and visas. And the KCH support inaugural hackers challenge. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Monday's news. Submissions for the proposed organic law on the Independent Commission Against Corruption is still open. Individuals and groups can either submit written and verbal submissions to the Department of Justice and Attorney General. The Department of Justice and Attorney General, led by Department Secretary Dr. Eric Kwa, presented the progress of the proposed law to the Parliamentary Committee Chairman Sir Peter Ipatas today. Also present were representatives from concerned organizations and individuals wanting to see PNG reduce its corruption rate. I have wavered uh, the conditions for the public to actually ask questions if they want to, uh, because uh, it is a uh, it is a very important law that we want to pass for the country and I think there has been a big public outcry for a long time for this uh, uh, law to be passed by parliament. The proposed law is evolving as political and public submissions are received by the department. Both the Secretary of the Department of Justice and Attorney General and Chairman of the ICAC Interim Office emphasize the need for collaboration between all government institutions for the proposed organic law to be successful. Once this proposed ICAC law on ICAC is passed, community and international perception will change. People will see that this current legislature is serious about addressing systematic and endemic public sector corruption. It needs all your support, everybody's support, to ensure that we all partake in the design and the development of IKIP with the hope that it answers or addresses the issues of corruption that we are currently encountering. Verbal submissions continue tomorrow morning at the Parliament State Function Room. Shamin Poreambe, National MTV News. Given the recent alarming statistics in fake passports and visas being used without proper authorization, the Immigration and Citizenship Authority has issued a stern warning to all foreigners. Those residing or moving in and out of the country must validate their travelling visas. The warning was reiterated by Minister for Immigration, Wesley Nukunj, in a news conference over the weekend. And at Cora reports. With the most recent alarm being the issuance of 176 fake visas supposedly being issued from the Immigration Department, the Minister for Immigration and Border Security issued this warning over the weekend. Those who are implicated in one way or the other, directly or indirectly, they will face the full force of law. Uh, the laws that, you know, uh, govern us, or the laws that give us the power and we will impose the maximum penalty with, with the staff who are involved. And for those who, who are, uh, that are indirectly involved or even directly involved, these are criminal matters. So we are doing this investigation together with the police. So we will refer, refer all of them uh, to the police and they will go through the normal uh, process, uh, the court process. So we, we're not going to take it lightly. The minister sanctioning an investigative task force team to do accurate checks on all foreigners in the country and report the findings of those in breach of PNG's immigration rules and regulations. While they're here, if they are using a wrong visa, it does not stop them from applying for the right visa. So first, my appeal to all the foreigners who are using the wrong visa to consult the department and apply for the right visa instead of using the wrong visa to, to uh, operate or live in the country. That's one. Two, for those uh, foreigners who are beneficiaries of one of the, uh, whoever is a beneficiary of the 176 fake visas, I made a call last week to the uh, media statement and I'm making the call again uh, uh, for them to 
they voluntarily come and surrender those fake wishes. Additionally, stating that a task force secretariat will be established within that department come the end of the month that will coordinate the joint task force operations in the country. The government is losing a lot of revenue in those foreigners who are operating within the country but violating visa rules. Uh, in the past, you know, some operations, the uh, customs officers are involved, IRC are involved, the police and our customs are involved when they go and, you know, just without informing anyone, they just go to the shop or to certain select uh, places and they do those uh, operations. Uh, but uh, under my ministry or under my leadership, we won't do that. Some of these are ad hoc. The Immigration Department is hopeful that with the findings from the current investigation of the fake 176 visas, the findings will be made known to the public and recommendations will be further implemented by the Joint Task Force Investigative Team. This immigration anticipates will be able to put to rest fears and uncertainties from the general public. Anit Kora, National MTV News. Meanwhile, after issuing the warning to all foreigners, the minister added that the permanent residency status issued to foreigners either before or during his term will be reviewed to cross-check any anomalies. Those found to have discrepancies will have their status revoked. Those uh, people who have been given uh, PR status, permanent resident status, during, either during my time without my knowledge, or prior to my time, I am also reviewing that. And if there are some, if I discover some anomalies in it, if some PRs were issued during my time, definitely they will be revoked. Because all PRs uh, must come through the minister. And if it has been approved by the acting CMO or by any other person, uh, I am giving you, I, I'm. I am uh, making it clear to the media that I will revoke all the PRs that were issued during my term without my knowledge. That's one. And then uh, if there are some uh, issues of uh, uh, PRs or citizenship that are in question and the conduct of those uh, uh, foreigners are in question and uh, poses a threat also to national security, I will use my powers to revoke as well. In its bid to have the Pogera special mining lease extended, operator of the Pogera gold mine, Barrack New Guinea, is now seeking international help. Barrack has lodged its complaint at the World Bank's International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes. This is to settle its dispute with the PNG government. According to Barrack, its latest action to initiate conciliation proceedings before the international body does not displace the judicial review proceedings that are pending before the PNG courts. The conciliation proceeding, however, seeks to reach an agreement for the extension of the Pogera SML on what Barrack says will be mutually beneficial to both the company and PNG stakeholders. Kumul Consolidated Holdings Limited or KCHL has stepped in to support the inaugural PNG Hackathon Challenge. The Hackathon Challenge, which will be hosted by the PNG Digital ICT Cluster, aims to address cross-cutting issues using ICT solutions. In a small ceremony today, KCHL presented a total of 20,000 kina to support this program. The inaugural hackathon challenge aims to encourage more creative and innovative people to work on existing problems in the country and find solutions to the problem using ICT. According to co-founder Priscilla Kevin, the theme of the challenge is based on the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The problem also aims to support SMEs and startups in the ICT space. It would be a good opportunity to uh, start talking about how to solve problems and encourage more people to come up and be confident of their ideas and to get the support, uh, the financial support, to get the mentoring, to get the coaching, to get the training to really, really help them to bring that idea to, to reality. 
The Hackathon Challenge have brought together many sponsors to help make this program a success. The sponsors include PNG Data Co, Digicel, Kumul Consolidate Holdings Limited, among others. And this afternoon, KCHL presented a check of 20,000 kina to support this program. State Enterprise Minister Sassin Ranmutuvel says the government is committed to support SMEs in the country and it is time to invest in ICT. We are living in 21st century and it's good to... Uh, good for us to recognize uh, this is an important sector where we need to engage our youths and um, we will be quite amazed uh, the amount of um, receptiveness from our young people like uh, they are quite good in terms of you know anything to do with uh, technical knowledge so and they will easily pick up if you are going to give them that platform and also the support. The PNC Digital ICT cluster with other partners have also developed a curriculum where children were taught scratch coding, robotics and drones. And through the Hackathon Challenge, children under the age of 5 to 13 will be showcasing their ICT skills. Minister Mutuvel was thankful for their initiative to develop the curriculum, saying every businesses need ICT solution. You're not just talking about creating SMEs, but also creating this ICT skilled you know people because every organization you need an IT person and uh, every businesses need uh, ICT solutions so but, uh, I think this one will go a long way if we can you know strengthen uh, this initiative and continue to get more uh, continue to do more awareness and uh, attract some support the inaugural PNG Hackers Challenge, which will begin on the 24th of this month, will see six teams competing. Each team will register online and must consist of one female and a software developer. The program ends on the 27th of this month. Um, and in the team, it needs to be made up of at least one female and an at least one software programmer or developer. Um, so during the program on the Saturday and Sunday, they get to do a closed um, hack session, which is where they get to work on the solution uh, relating to the team topic which is on the United Nations 17 sustainable development goals. Rayon Lakingu National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Normalcy has been restored at Koki in the Mosby South electorate of the nation's capital. Police confirm that one man has died following confrontations over pickpocketing. Heavy police presence as of 10 a.m. this morning seized tensions between two ethnic groups involved in the clash that started last night. The clash also resulted in the closure of the fresh produce market. Member for Mosby South, Justin Tichenko, visited the Wanigela community soon after the fight this morning and called for peace. He urged the communities to work closely with the police. As part of its commitments in assisting impacted communities of the fiber optic cable project, PNG Data Co. today officially handed over a brand new three-in-one two-bedroom unit to the Kila Police Barracks. The ceremony, witnessed by police officers and their families, was described by Police Commissioner David Manning as a blessing for the constabulary as housing remains an issue for policemen and women in the country. As PNG Data Co. continues to roll out the Coral Sea Cable System and the Kumul Submarine Cable Network throughout the country, the company is also delivering its community development projects. And this morning's ceremony was the first of many, as Data Co. officially handed over the keys to three newly built two-bedroom units. The Kilapolis Barracks houses the men and women of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary Band. These pictures show the state of the houses many of these officers are living in with their families. But when Data Co. sought land to build its landing station, Kila Barracks was an ideal location. And fast forward to 2020, it will now enjoy the spin-offs of this massive government investment. Data Co. Managing Director Paul Comboy says, as per the company's commitments, it will also assist in building a band house with a set of new instruments. Uh, I'd like to state here now that we've made commitments already with the keynote and uh, the payment has been made for the instrument for uh, the police band that's done already. We want to deliver that uh, when we complete the band all, so everything can come uh, at the same time. 
Police Commissioner David Manning, whilst acknowledging the partnership with PNG Datako, did not shy away from the issue of police housing in the country. He described the occasion as a blessing for the police force, especially for killer barracks. We're struggling, as I said, we're competing with resources. We're not the only government service in the country. Um, killer barracks is not the only only uh, directorate in the constabulary. So, you know, when when a donation or in the likes of this comes across our way, you you know, we have to count our blessings and we have to give give thanks where 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 it's due. Uh, this type of this type of uh, Assistance to the constabulary is very, very significant. Meanwhile, Convoy further stated that ACO will continue a number of programs within the Vabukori area. This includes ICT services for the Sevese Moria Primary School and community engagement programs through sporting activities. Uh, we plan to provide uh, free internet access as well as uh, a, a building an ICT classroom for for the Sevese Moria. Most of our our Occupants here uh, in the barracks and around the surrounding community, you send your children out there for school. So I think this is one way where we can really uh, contribute uh, towards your social development by uh, putting in proper infrastructure for uh, the school to be able to educate our children properly. As we know, uh, we're moving into the uh, digital era right now. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. The support to rural entrepreneurship investment and trade or street PNG team were recently in two districts of East Pacific Province. This was to raise awareness on the kind of support available under the European Union co-financed program. In Angaram, the team visited a market facility where fish products and other goods are sold. One of its activities is to ensure reliable and decent market facilities are accessible to add value to fish production to marketing. At Waseragawi, the team discussed possible ways of creating an environment where women and youth will also be supported. The program only supports farmers in cluster groups who are already involved in farming activities. Street is currently being implemented in 10 districts of East and West Pacific provinces. Pulolo District Administrator Taigua Belek said the District Development Authority misused 2 million kina of the district's COVID-19 funds. Guambelek announced this a week after he was notified of his sidelining by the DDA chairman and Bulolo MP Sam Basel. Basel confirmed today that the COVID-19 funds were used for transportation during the lockdown in order to assist farmers and villagers to improve their livelihoods. Everywhere this. The Bulolo District Administrator and CEO Tai Gwambelek claimed that the Bulolo MP and Minister for National Planning, Sam Basil, diverted 2 million kina of the COVID-19 money to fund other projects in the district. Gwambelek said the district projects were supposed to be funded by the DSIP money and not the COVID-19 funds. This is a COVID-19 fund and we pay him 224,000 kina 224,000 plus. The wages belong on roadworks. The buan, the lo mumeng, mumeng laid on yard, the elsewhere, and 224,000 plus kina and COVID-19 funding pay for them. This is not COVID-19 operation. And funding belong DSIP. My officers only walk him so walk. And me play, me play, got me play and carry him. Uh, me play and carry him. Outstanding allowances for all officers in the police and all public in Bulolo is 215,000. And we don't have that money to pay for my, I do not have that money to pay for my public servants. In a response to this, Bulolo MP and Minister for National Planning Sam Basil said the COVID-19 funds were used for transportation during the lockdown in order to assist farmers and villagers to improve their livelihood. Now for my district we know that uh, uh, from Waria Valley we've hired uh, planes and we did free pickup of goods from Leh straight to Waria Valley. Uh, very unfortunate people from the border such as Ward 25 of Mumeng LLG, we've uh, bought them outboard motors 
for them to travel to lay a 40 mile and back because they are at the back page of the district. So I put those people first when I when I start to uh, distribute those funds to make sure that we we uh, attend to the needy ones, very needy ones first, which is normally they call themselves as no man's land with the border where they don't know whether which which district or which provinces looks after them. So we did the same in uh, Kakoro. Uh, we're sending a team down. Uh, to Kakoro because we've given boats for Tekaru people to access Port Mosby. There was a dispute, so we funded the process of making sure that the boats are uh, delivered properly to the right people to use. And of course, we looked at uh, uh, Fresh Food um, Farmers Association in Wow. We've empowered them with a car to make sure that they bring their produce to the markets because they were complaining during the shutdown they lost a lot of things. So, Kwambelek said he only signed the first batch of the COVID-19 funds before he was notified of his sidelining by the MP. The process of sidelining an officer is a prerogative of the Department of Personal Management through direction to a provincial administrator. Uh, through a provincial administrator. But uh, this, uh, my sidelining, uh, I, I, I cannot uh, elaborate as to how and why I'm sidelined. Almost a month ago, we've got advice from the provincial administration that our DA will be transferred out of Bulolo. And I think it's regarding to some of the cases where it was still um, uh, energy manager of Wau Rural. And I think there was some funding that uh, didn't go down too well with the accounting system of the government. So, so the case was taken up to court. That was when before he was in my DA. In March this year, more than 600 million kina was allocated by the national government to utilize during the SOE following the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2018, last year, 450 million kina was allocated for disaster relief in the Southern Highlands following the earthquake. The government is yet to announce to the 8 million plus people of PNG how the SOE funds were managed. Julie Badui Owa. National MTV News, Lei. Deteriorating health infrastructures continue to plague rural areas in East New Britain province for many years. The Gaulim Health Centre in the inland binding LLG of Gazelle District is one rural health facility that is in need of repair. The clinic buildings and staff houses are slowly crumbling and medical supplies don't always arrive on time. Edwin Fidelis reports from Kokopo. This is Gaulim Health Centre, located in the inland binding local level government in the Gazelle district, about an hour drive out of Kokopo town. The health centre serves more than five wards living in the LLG, but it is a health facility in need of repair. At the outpatient, the walls and the floors are partially gone. Next to the outpatient building is a new maternity wing, opened in 2016. But it hasn't been fully utilized as the building was rendered unfit to deliver pregnant mothers. I present a bit. Now we start making new puppies. It's about to be complete now. There's a main reason why we plan to deliver him. All my man is delivering here. George Appa, a community health worker attached with the health centre, tells me both the clinic buildings and staff houses have fallen into a state of disrepair, with many of them already condemned but still being used, and medical supplies rarely arrive on time at the health centre. In Marasin and Gaulim, and one plus last plus facility, we have received medical supplies, especially drugs. Drugs, you know, come in amount where them can cater more patients. All patient, all sick man. Until recently, there are signs of help coming to the health facility, slowly but surely. At least two staff houses are currently undergoing renovations and the condemned outpatient building is expected to be rehabilitated in the coming months. Concern for me, also, me like him, also, uh, me, me, me like him, also, this little uh, staff houses, uh, should be me asking more authorities to just come around and visit me. Like anywhere else in Papua New Guinea, accessing basic health services remains a main struggle for the people in rural areas. 
The Gaulim Health Center is a church-run facility managed by the United Church and the Gazelle District Administration through the public-private partnership concept. The Gaulim Health Center is one facility in the province where staff members have spoken out about the state of the facility, but there are many others in the province with similar problems that haven't spoken out yet. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. And now looking at the Nasvand market report, the Kina closed five points lower at 0.294 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2805 US dollars, 0.3994 Australian dollars, 0.2400 New Zealand dollars and 29.34 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee and cocoa closed higher and copper closed lower. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower and copper closed lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 369.21 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 76.7 points higher and the All Ordinaries is trading at 74.7 points higher. You're watching National AMTV News. We'll be back with stories making headlines overseas. Don't go away. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, a record increase in COVID-19 infections has been reported by the World Health Organization with 230,000 new cases in just 24 hours. Infections are spiking in Brazil, India and South Africa, while the United States is struggling to cope with the record rise in numbers across the states. As America's surging COVID wave tops 3.2 million cases, hospitals are struggling. 17 states with a record high number of cases, 15 with record hospitalizations, and seven with a record number of deaths. It feels as though that we're headed for a disaster. Florida's in difficulty, hitting a record daily total for any state, more than 15,300 cases, forcing some Sunshine State hospitals to create makeshift wards. So we've just taken literally every inch of the facility and converted it into patient care areas. There's no sign of the virus slowing despite more than 130,000 deaths. 42 hospitals across Florida now without available ICU beds. Arizona reporting ICUs 89% full. And 13 states report problems with testing. Long queues causing a wait of up to 30 days for results. We are seeing positivity rates above 20%. We are setting records of the type you don't want to set. But after months of resistance, the president's finally wearing a mask. The commander-in-chief falling into line visiting injured service personnel. People that in some cases just got off the operating tables. I think it's a great thing to wear a mask. I've never been against masks. But I do believe they have a, a time and a place. The U.S. now bracing for the summer surge continuing, large gatherings fueling the spread. In California, refrigeration containers on standby as makeshift morgues after 1,233 deaths alone last weekend. What we're looking at is what I think is going to be one of the most unstable times in the history of our country unless we figure out a way to do something. Solutions too late for 250 Mexicans who fell victim to COVID-19 in New York. Their ashes repatriated to loved ones waiting in Mexico City. Nicole Australia's largest city is on the verge of another COVID-19 outbreak. Sydney officials are warning that community transmission is to be blamed. The state of Victoria records a week of triple-digit increase of COVID-19 cases. 
Lining up outside a Sydney pub, not for a drink, but to find out if they have COVID-19. We were here Friday night. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we've queued up. Of course, it was a week ago now, no symptoms, so hopefully come back negative. A hotel worker testing positive to the virus. He's a family friend of Sandra Sullivan. He was told last night at about seven, um, and my son had been with him, so yeah, that's why we're all here this morning. 13 cases are now linked to the outbreak at the Crossroads Hotel. Hotel. That is a particular venue um, that is also um, frequented uh, by people who do transnational um, freight driving. New South Wales recording 14 new infections today. There are 18 active cases. This house party in the beachside suburb of Bondi shut down. Hundreds gathering when there should have only been 20. The state premier worried that cases are being spread locally. We are definitely at a crossroads in New South Wales. We have the chance now to really clamp down on community transmission or else unfortunately we'll go down the track of what Victoria is going through. Victoria today recording another 177 new infections with 1,612 active Active cases. And then I did go, oh my gosh, here we go again. Melbourne mum Ginny Ballard has two kids in school. Next week it's back to homeschooling. There's no reason why we can't do it again. We haven't even got a, gotten to a peak with this epidemic and we have to throw absolutely everything at it. It's the public health challenge of our lifetime. Defence Force staff are back on Victoria's border with New South Wales and will remain there for at least another month. As COVID-19 cases continue to soar around the world, the number of patients requiring intensive level care on ventilators is also rising. Right now, each ventilator can only support one person, of course. But a group of engineers from Canterbury University think that they have found a solution to that, and they're doing it for free. Device so small... It doesn't really look like it could save a life. What we have down here is the idea for ventilating two patients at one time. Two patients, one ventilator, and an oxygen delivery tailored especially for different patients' needs. It's never been done before until these Canterbury University engineers put their heads together over lockdown. It's a piece of cleverness. So it's a clever solution to an urgent problem. With COVID numbers climbing stratospherically. And I am within two weeks of having our hospitals overrun. And in our ICUs, I could be 10 days away from that. 10 days away. Oh my goodness. This ICU specialist says the discovery could help solve a huge international problem. The problem is generated by the fact that we will globally run out of ventilators if COVID continues its exponential increase around the world. So every time you get to use this, um, there's an opportunity for a patient to live who would have otherwise died. Ventilators have proven critical in keeping many COVID sufferers alive. It is our bread and butter. Um, it is to us what an aircraft might be to a you know, combat fighter. Um, I mean, we can't do our job without it. They're on to their fourth 3D printed prototype. Yeah. This print's taken about eight hours so far. We've got another 10 to go. Thanks to these PhD students putting in many late nights. I think it would feel good to know that we've been able to put a bit of work in that will probably affect thousands of lives in a positive way. So. They should be ready to share the concept with the world in three weeks. The instructions will be free online. I don't really want to profit on the back of a pandemic, on the back of the suffering of people. It will cost less than $100 to produce this unit and twice as many lives could be saved. Lisa Day. And True Guy Sports is next. Fidele Sukina is at the Sports Desk. Thank you, Helen. More action from the Rugby League Intercity Cup. Join me for True Guy Sports after the break. Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. In news just in, Jack Kadea, the treasurer of Port Mosby Rugby Football League and founding chairman of the Central Province Premier League, has passed on. 
Kedea is a life member of the Poma RFL as well, a member of Lloyd Robson Oval Trust, the trustees to the National Football Stadium. A well-known figure in rugby league circles, Jack was a former Kumuls team manager in 2010 and was team manager of the Port Mosby Vipers in 2013 and 2014. He was also a founding team manager for Hella Wigman when they, first when they were first coached by Justin O'Neill and Luke Goodwin. He also served as transport manager for Australian High Commission from 1976 until his retirement in 2014. Close friend David Silova described Jack as a charming, humble person who will be sh sorely missed by family, friends and the rugby league fraternity. Jack Kedea passed away at the Port Mosby General Hospital today after a short illness. The Yagmak Rabal Gurias shook off Gulf Iso, throwing them a barrage of points in yesterday's round two of the Intercity Cup competition. Seven unanswered tries by the Gurias with the Gulf Iso team, only managing one penalty conversion. Going in the way of Gulf Iso managed to get ahead in the first half through a penalty conversion. That two points would be their only points in the whole match. What came after was the Egmark Rabal Gurias dominance. It was like watching a practice session with the Gurias catch and pass having little resistance from the Iso defense, allowing Eliakim Lukara to dive over for the Gurias first try. 19 minutes later, Tuvi Lepan running through a hole in defense scored the team second. The Gurias take a 10-2 lead at halftime. The second half saw more flat-footed defense by Gulf Iso, allowing Stanley Olo a dummy half run to the try line. Time. What's the reference call? Yeah. The 16 points to two lead was extended with a good kick chased by Terry Wapi. Uh, here comes the big kick, and uh, yes, that should be a try. Wow. The Gurias had a comfortable 20 point lead, but were not done yet, with interchange prop Mocha Pita adding more salt to the wounds. Oh, good line there from Mocha, and there goes another try to the Gurias. Silas Gahuna added to the scoreboard next, celebrating in style. Back to uh, Gahuna, and there goes Gahuna. The last try came through a break to Stanley Olo. Backing up was Terry Wapi, who raced away for the seventh try of the match. Wapi goes in for his second try. The game ended with the overwhelming winners, Gurias, 38 points to two against a lackluster Iso outfit. In the second match of yesterday's doubleheader in Port Mosby, defending Premier's Lace Next Tigers mauled the Dabaris 14 po 40 points to 10. Sorry, The Tigers had three players score doubles on Sunday, ending an epic show of dominance by the Morobe-based franchise. Morooks. Uh, Defending Premier's Lace Next Tigers, yesterday didn't need to try hard to claw their way to a win, with opportunities opening up for the team. Four minutes into the match, fullback Joe Joshua capitalizing on the Dabari's loose defense line for the team's first converted try. For the Tigers, just like that. It took a while, but 23 minutes later, another gap opened up for prop Junior Rope to score the team's second try. And there goes a very easy try. The 12-0 lead was extended when Anderson Benford managed to find yet another yawning gap, bringing the score to 18-0 at half time. Benford. And the Dabaris came back in the second half. So the they looked scrappy, but managed to string together a try to Michael Yanis. Again, stretching their arms, but uh, the team trails 18-6 after a solid conversion by Junior Bello. Uh, but the Tigers pounced back. Junior Rob begging his second try. And Junior Rob goes right through. The score was extended to 24 points to 6 with Charlie Simon's boot. The Dabaris felt helpless again with Tigers center Gary Warrior crossing the field in a diagonal run to score for the Tigers. With a score at 30 points to 6, it seemed too good to be true, but yes, Joe Joshua went in for his second try. And Joshua is there. Wow. Charlie Simon extending the lead to 36 points to 6. The Dabaris were hopping on a limb but managed to string together a try to forward Gary Ware. And Gary Ware is going to go over for the Dabaris. 
with a score at 36 points to 10. It seemed everyone was going for seconds with Anderson Benford saving himself his second try and the final one for the match. The game ending 40 points to 10 in favor of the Lace Next Tigers. And Trukai Sports continues after the break with some news on cricket overseas. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. The West Indies have gone one nil up in their lockdown test series with England. Thanks to a heroic knock from Jamie Blackwood, the visitors f pulled off an incredible recovery to win by four wickets. For all the theories which swirl around Test cricket, it can be simple. Ten wickets or 200 runs. England dismissed two West Indies batsmen at Jofra Archer pace. Mark Wood's quick two, 27 for three when Hope left the field. But then it was Jermaine Blackwood. Pleasant. A dashing batsman who played the occasion. England had chances to get him out if Joss Butler had held this catch. Well... West Indies were halfway there when Chase fell to Archer. But Blackwood? That's a good shot. Nerveless. Full. Still 11 to win when he was finally out for 95, he'd done enough. The winning moment on the final evening. Victory for the West Indies. So much had gone into cricket's restart, this match deserved to hold our attention. And it's just the first of the series. Lots of cricket to be played. You know, I told the guys there's 15 days of cricket that we have in this series. We've so far finished five. You know, we've got 10 tough days left in, in this series, and you know we've got to be up for every single day and every single session. I've really enjoyed the challenge of managing everything. Last night was my worst night uh, thinking about today. Uh, the other nights I was actually alright. I managed to get to sleep quite easily, but I can see how Rudy loses sleep considering he does it full time. <laughs> Yeah, Joe Root will be back to Captain England. The biggest compliment for the first ever lockdown test. It was throughout a proper match. And that story ends Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region mostly fine, then afternoon showers developing in Port Moresby, partly cloudy with chances of afternoon rain drizzles in Daru, mostly fine then chances of afternoon rain drizzles in Kerama and Popondita and cloudy with occasional rain showers in Alatau. In the Mamasi region mostly fine weather in Lee, mostly fine although cloudy at times in Middang. Cloudy with chances of afternoon rain showers in Wewak and Tuanimor. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine, although cloudy at times in Loringau and Kaviang. Cloudy with chances of occasional showers in Kokopo and Rabao. Mostly fine, then possible afternoon showers in Kimbe and mostly fine, though cloudy with chances of afternoon showers in Buka. And in the Highlands region, mostly fine, then chances of afternoon showers in Mount Hagen. Mostly fine weather in Goroka and Kondiala. Cloudy with a chance of afternoon rain drizzles in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's been the new sport and weather for Monday 13th of July 2020. From all of us here at MTV, pleasant viewing. Bye for now.